Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and this lecture pertains to the hemolytic anemia chapter of Hematology and Transfusion Medicine Board Review Made Simple. Hemolysis is the destruction of red blood cells. If the marrow can compensate by increasing reticulocytosis, then it's compensated hemolysis. If the marrow cannot compensate by increasing reticulocytosis, then it's incompletely compensated hemolysis. Secondary changes could be seen are elevated LDH, elevated bilirubin, especially indirect, low haptoglobin, pallor, and increased reticulocytosis. <clears throat> if hemolysis is intravascular due to complement mediated destruction, such as PNH, it will produce hemocytorrhea. If hemolysis is chronic or extravascular, for instance in the spleen, and such as hereditary spherocytosis, may produce bilirubinate gallstones. Classification of hemolytic anemias can be either hereditary, such as sickle cell disease, or acquired autoimmune hemolytic anemia, or intrinsic, such as pyruvate kinase deficiency, or extrinsic, such as DTP. Normal hemoglobin. The oxygen-carrying capability of the red blood cells relies on hemoglobin, a tetramer protein consisting of two pairs of globin chains bound to the heme molecule, which consists of the ferrous iron and the protoporphyrin ring. There are four major types of globins labeled as alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. The dominant hemoglobin in adults, hemoglobin A, is composed of two alpha and two beta chains. The expression of each globin gene is under the control distant upstream locus control region, LCR. <clears throat> As the oxygen binds to the ferrous iron, the iron moves from being slightly above the plane of the protoporphyrin ring to the level of the protoporphyrin ring. This causes a 15 degree rotation of the four globin protein, causing the hemoglobin to convert from the tense, the deoxyhemoglobin state, to the relaxed oxyhemoglobin state, and allows for easier binding of additional oxygen molecules to the other heme rings, called cooperativity. As the oxygen displaces off the iron, the hemoglobin assumes back the tense form, and 2,3-BPG, which is bisphosphoglycerate, stabilizes the structure. Here we see the hemoglobin dissociation curve, x-axis being the PO2, y-axis the percent hemoglobin saturation. As so you can see in the lung, for instance, where the PO2 is very, very high, the percentage of the, human, the hemoglobin saturation will also be elevated. But as the red blood cells travel throughout the bloodstream and reach areas of lower PO2, then the oxygen is given off. Anything that shifts this graph to the right will decrease hemoglobin oxygen affinity. Therefore, hemoglobin will give off this oxygen more readily. These things will be either, either acidotic states, states where the PCO2 is increased, temperature increases, or 2,3 BPG increases. Now anything that shifts the graph to the left will increase hemoglobin oxygen affinity. So the oxygen will not be given up so easily. <clears throat> and this occurs in the setting of alkalosis, CO2 decreases, or temperature decreases. Very important to know that the PO2 at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated with oxygen is 26 million moles of mercury. This is crucial to know once we get to the hemoglobin affinity issues. <clears throat> Again, a left shifted curve, the hemoglobin binds more tightly to oxygen. The patient will develop erythrocytosis. A right shifted curve, the hemoglobin releases oxygen more readily. So the patient will be anemic because it doesn't need as many RBCs to deliver the same amount of oxygen to the tissue. Remember that at PO2 of 26 millimeters mercury, 50% of hemoglobin will be saturated with oxygen. So that P50 of hemoglobin is 26. Very, very important to know. <coughs> Different normal hemoglobins. Hemoglobin A is 2 alpha, 2 beta. Hemoglobin A2 is 2 alpha, 2 delta. Hemoglobin F is 2 alpha, 2 gamma. In quote-unquote normal adults, these hemoglobin molecules make up the following percentages of total hemoglobin. Hemoglobin A will be about 95 to 98 percent. 
hemoglobin A2 will be about 2 to 3 percent, and hemoglobin F will be about 1 to 2 percent, and there'll be no hemoglobin S or hemoglobin C. And you must know these percentages for either the USMLE, the internal medicine boards, and obviously the hematology boards. Now, disorders of hemoglobin, qualitative, referred to as hemoglobinopathies, arise from mutations that changes the amino acid structure of the globin. Problems related to qualitative defects are either decreased hemoglobin solubility, altered oxidative states of the heme coordinated iron, hemoglobin instability, and altered hemoglobin oxygen affinity. Quantitative disorders such as thalassemias arise from imbalance of one globin structure over another. So alpha thalassemia is usually due to deletion of DNA except hemoglobin constant spring, and you must know that. <coughs> Beta thalassemia is usually due to point mutations. And very important, imbalance of either chain will lead to accelerated destruction of the RBC precursors in the bone marrow, leading to ineffective erythropoiesis. Beta thalassemia case report, <coughs> 25-year-old male presenting with routine checkup and discovered to have hemoglobin of 10, which is microcytic, but normal RBC count, that's a key word. Normal WBC in platelets. Target cells appreciated on the peripheral smear and slightly elevated iron indices. That's due to increased ion absorption from ineffective erythropoiesis. Hemoglobin electrophoresis reveals hemoglobin A to be 91%, remember that's low. Hemoglobin A2 to be 6%, that's high. Hemoglobin F to be 4%, that's high. So what is the diagnosis? Beta thalassemia minor. If you're presented with the same case, but a normal hemoglobin electrophoresis, that would be alpha thalassemia minor. <clears throat> Many different mutations lead to beta thalassemia, ranging from spike sites to exons to introns and polyadenylation signal region of the gene, but it's usually due to point mutations. If the mutation is in the coding region of the exon, this will lead to complete loss of beta globin production. So you will have beta zero thalassemia. Remember, we'll have no hemoglobin A since there's no beta globin chain being produced. If the mutation occurs in the transcriptional regulation region, this will lead to decreased beta globin production. That would be beta plus thalassemia. Again, beta thalassemia minor patients will have slightly lower hemoglobin A and slightly higher hemoglobin A2. You must know this. Usually the treatment is none, as they'll be asymptomatic. Now the beta thalassemia classification is obviously normal is normal B, normal B. Thalassemia minor would be normal B or B0, or normal B and B+. Plus. The intermediate will be B0 slash B+, plus, and the major will be B0 slash B0 or B plus slash B+. Plus. Beta thalassemia major in adults. Since no beta chain is being produced, normal adult A will not be produced. So we'll have zero hemoglobin A, 30% A2, and 70% F. Beta thalassemia minor treatment, they will be severe transfusion dependent their entire life since they do not produce hemoglobin A. Begin iron chelation once ferritin is above 1,000. And splenectomy of severe abdominal pain because they may develop splenomegaly due to secondary erythropoiesis. Allogeneic stem cell transplant can be curative, and this is a potential boards question. Patients with iron overloaded livers do worse in an allogeneic setting. <coughs> alpha thalassemia. There's two copies of alpha gene present on each chromosome 16. Alpha thalassemia is pri primarily due to DNA deletion except hemoglobin constant strength. The alpha thalassemia traits, the carriers are either alpha zero thalassemia, very important to know, which is both missing on the same gene, so dash dash slash AA seen in Asia. This results in loss of linked gene on the same chromosome. Or alpha plus thalassemia, which is one gene missing from each, seen in Africa. Or the silent carrier, which is only missing one, you have three seen in one of three Africans. Hemoglobin constant spring is a common non-deletion alpha plus thalassemia in Asia. Mutation is in the termination of translation, which causes a long alpha chain. 
Homozygous alpha zero thalassemia, missing all four. Case report. 30-year-old pregnant female from Southeast Asia without any past hematologic history aside from long-standing slight microcytic anemia, so she has alpha thal traits, presents with polyhydraminose and fetus size in utero at 35 weeks gestation. Fetus is marked about a centimegly, marked expansion of the bones, and enlargement of the placenta. This is all from secondary erythropoiesis sites. What happened? Both parents were alpha zero thalassemia carriers, so dash dash slash AA, and hemoglobin electrophoresis of the fetus reveals 80% hemoglobin BART, that's 4 Gs, gammas, and 20% hemoglobin Portland, D2, G2. If two parents who are both alpha zero thalassemia carriers mate, they have a 25% chance of having offspring who is alpha zero thalassemia homozygous, so no alpha chains being produced. This is referred to as hydrox fatalis, which is seen in Asia. That is why they screen for alpha zero thalassemia trait in Asia. <clears throat> if homozygous alpha zero thalassemia, patient will manifest hemoglobin BART, which is 4 Gs, very high affinity, oxygen and feeding hemoglobin, which leads to hypoxia, and hemoglobin H, which is 4 Vs, unstable, and causes precipitation of the hemoglobin. Treatment and utero blood transfusions as well as lifetime transfusion requirements, but most on utero. Superglobin H disease, missing three A's. Patient will survive, and for the most part, will not require special intervention, aside from times of stress, such as infection, in which hemolytic anemia may be precipitated. Heterozygous alpha zero thalassemia. Again, patient will have mild hyperchromic anemia, microcytic anemia, with target cells, just like beta thalassemia traits, but remember, the hemoglobin electrophoresis will be normal, unlike beta thalassemia traits in which the hemoglobin A2 and F will be slightly elevated. There is no intervention needed aside from screening parents to assess with if they are both alpha zero thal trait carriers. Now, heterozygous alpha plus thalassemia, seen in 3% of blacks in the U.S., will present with light microcytic anemia and normal hemoglobin electrophoresis often get mistaken for iron deficiency anemia even though these patients actually have increased iron absorption due to the ineffective erythropoiesis. If patient has microcytic anemia, look at RBC count and iron level. If both are normal or elevated, think thalassemia trait. There's no intermission needed for heterozygous alpha positive trait. <coughs> sickle cell disease. In sickle cell disease, <clears throat> a hydrophobic valine is substituted for the normal hydrophilic glutamic acid at six position of beta globin chain, which results in decreased solubility during the hemoglobin deoxygenated state. Imagine each RBC has about 250 million hemoglobins. If during the deoxygenated state all of them align as to protect the new hydrophobic valine at the beta 6 position, this will overwhelm the cytoskeleton of the RBC, causing cyclin. The sickle cell trait and thalassemia trait provide protection from malaria infections. The patients may manifest if homozygous sickle cell disease, then both beta chains will be mutated. That's hemoglobin SS. <coughs> Heterozygous sickle cell disease is one mutated beta chain and one normal beta chain, hemoglobin S slash B. The compound heterozygous sickle cell disease is one mutated sickle cell beta chain and another mutated chain of a different kind. For instance, hemoglobin S slash thalassemia. Now, sickle cell trait, the AS, is more than 60% hemoglobin A and 40% hemoglobin S, seen in 10% of the U.S. African population. Benign, but may develop renal, papillary necrosis, and pyelonephritis during pregnancy. Very important to know. <coughs> now, common hemoglobin findings in sickle cell disease. That's hemoglobin SS. 90% hemoglobin S and a little bit of hemoglobin A2 and F, no hemoglobin A. That's hemoglobin S beta 0 thalassemia. Remember, no hemoglobin A will be produced. So we'll have 80% hemoglobin S and slightly higher hemoglobin F. If it's hemoglobin S slash beta thal, there's still a small amount of normal beta chain being produced. So you'll have about 20% hemoglobin A, 60% S, and 17% F. 
hemoglobin SC will have 50% SE or 50% C. And in hemoglobin S traits, we'll have 60% A and 40% S. You must know all of these by heart for the hematology boards. <clears throat> the severity of sickle cell disease will not only depend on the compliance of the patient with the treatment, but also the amount of fetal hemoglobin which the body is able to produce either naturally or in response to hydrea. And we'll go over that shortly. Sickle cell disease haplotypes. There are clusters of genes which may be identified via restriction fragment like polymorphisms that assign the disease its haplotype. Define the severity of the disease. There are five different sickle cell haplotypes defined by how much fetal hemoglobin will be produced. The worst is the Central African Republic in which the least fetal hemoglobin is produced. The best kind is the Cameroon and Senegal in which more hemoglobin F will be produced so the disease will be less severe. In between are the Arab Indian and the Benin sickle cell. So, <clears throat> please remember there are sickle cell patients that are very compliant yet they often end up in the emergency room over and over again that is not due to opiate seeking or being non-compliant they simply have the worst haplotype of sickle cell disease that means their body does not produce very much hemoglobin F and they have severe disease the more hemoglobin F is produced, the milder the disease state. The disease haplotype dictates why one compliant patient might have many complications of sickle cell disease, while another compliant patient will have much less disease-associated problems. If patient has many complications of sickle cell disease and has a low fetal hemoglobin, may consider initiating hydroxyurea to increase the percentage of hemoglobin F produced, and hopefully lessen the severity of the disease. <clears throat> Cohen erections of alpha thalassemia with sickle cell disease will decrease hemolytic anemia and strokes. The ratio will be 80% hemoglobin A and 20% hemoglobin S. The sickle to RBCs cause vasoclusive disease by not just sickling but also increased adherence to the vascular endothelium, leading to platelet and coagulation system activation. The sickle cell prep and the turbidity test do not differentiate between sickle cell disease and the sickle cell trait. So remember, the sickle cell dex test cannot tell you whether someone has hemoglobin S trait or the disease, only that there is hemoglobin S in the body. Clinical manifestations of sickle cell disease, many as we all know. Number one, shortens RBC survival from 120 days to 25 days. Chronic vasoclusion, sickling and increased binding to endothelium. Next, chronic anemia but there's increased to 3 BPG, so the body compensates, so please do not transfuse them liberally. Aplastic crisis, seen with a power infection. Next sequestration crisis in liver and spleen can occur at either SC or S fetal plus. Next superimposed autoimmune hemolysis. Folate or B12 deficiency. Increased gallstones. Acute phase occlusion hypoxia and occlusion of microcirculation precipitated by dehydration, cold temperatures, infection, pregnancy, working out or stress. Next, hand foot syndrome, dactylitis. Remember, it occurs at six months once fetal hemoglobin decreases. This is due to bone marrow necrosis of the hands and feet. It's a consideration for allo stem cell transplant in children since it is such a poor prognostic indicator of things to come. Long bone infarcts leads to osteomyelitis, either salmonella or staph. Acute chest syndrome, <clears throat> medical emergency, take hypoxia and chest pain very seriously in sickle cell patients. It's an indication for exchange transfusion. Next, pulmonary hypertension. Next, cerebral infarction, which is another indication for RBC exchange transfusion. Next, right-sided heart failure. Decrease nitrogen oxide leading to pulmonary hypertension. Nevertheless, the Viagra study was negative in sickle cell patients with right-sided heart failure. Next, renal papillary necrosis, due to causing ischemic glomeruli. Next, priapism, another indication for RBC exchange transfusion. Next, retinal artery occlusion and vitreous hemorrhage. Next, streptomonium meningitis, 
secondary to autosplenectomy from long-standing splenic infarcts. Next, opiate dependence and abuse. Chronic pain leads to dependence and possible addiction. Next, L immunization to RBC antigens for multiple blood transfusions, so please be very judicious with blood transfusions. And last, pregnancy-related problems. Higher spontaneous abortions and preeclampsia occurrences, low birth weight babies, and preterm delivery, secondary to chronic hypoxia. Hemoglobin SC disease. Do not take the disease lightly. There is characteristic high volume stimulated potassium efflux out of the RBC. Consequently, intracellular cations and water content of the hemoglobin C cells are strikingly reduced, which will exasperate the problem with the sickle cell component of the RBC from increasing dehydration. There is increased intraerythrocytic concentration of total hemoglobin. It leads to increased water loss hence increased target cells on smear and increased blood viscosity. It leads to more, this is very important to know, it leads to more ocular and bone complications including a vascular necrosis than hemoglobin SS patients. <coughs> Preventive interventions of sickle cell disease. Vaccinate for pneumococcus, hemophilus, hepatitis B, influenza, twice daily penicillin, prophylaxis until H5, folic acid, and opto exams. Sickle cell disease and RBC transfusions. Most patients receive transfusions unnecessarily. Remember, they have increased to 3 BPG, so body compensates for anemia. Overt transfusions will lead to alloimmune antibody formation, which then will make true transfusions a challenge when they're truly needed. So take home message, transfuse only if truly needed. Sickle cell pain crisis, case report. 22-year-old African-American man with a long history of sickle cell disease presents with typical pain in his back. He denies chest pain, shortness of breath, fever, and is not hypoxic. So right away you know it's not acute chest. Stacy was in the sun and became quite dehydrated, which is a very common cause of acute chest syndrome. Hemoglobin 7 with 11% reticulocytes. Over the ensuing eight years, he's had nine episodes of crisis, which has brought him to the hospital, requiring admission on two occasions. During this period, his hemoglobin has varied from 6.6 .6 to about 8.5, chest x-ray without infiltrates. And the acute setting of pain crisis must rule out infection as the cause. Treatment. <clears throat> Begin prompt analgesia with opiates. Avoid NSAIDs if possible due to renal toxicity in dehydrated patients. Use hypotonic crystalloid fluids, D5W, to draw food into the RBC and decrease the coins. Use maintenance analgesia with PCA pumps, if possible. And routine pain crisis, prescribed incentive spirometry, since patients have shallow breathing due to pain and goal is to avoid atelectasis and possible progression to acute chest syndrome. There is no need to transfuse blood for routine pain crisis. Indications for simple RBC transfusions in sickle cell patients. One, aphylactic crisis. Two, recurring strokes. But remember, the original stroke requires exchange transfusion. Three, high output cardiac failure. Four, osteomyelitis. Five, non healing lower extremity ulcer. Six, pulmonary hypertension. And seven, simple surgery with anesthesia time less than 30 minutes. Now, <clears throat> indications for exchange transfusion to achieve hemoglobin is less than 30%. Acute strokes in children and adults, either ischemic or hemorrhagic acute chest syndrome and hypoxia. When surgeon intends to create a dry field using a vasoclusive tourniquet, complicated surgery requiring more than 30 minutes of general anesthesia time or patients with cardiac pulmonary disease, children at high risk for strokes with PVCVA, priapism, never not for the primary therapy since there's increased risk of CVA only if injections fail, acute ocular occlusions, clinical or liver sequestration crisis. In hemoglobin SC disease, avoid hemoglobin higher than 10 as it may cause hypoviscosity. Patients with hemoglobin SC disease usually require exchange transfusions over simple transfusions as they usually have hemoglobin over 10, so a simple transfusion would worsen the hyperviscosity state. <clears throat> Hyperhemolysis and sickle cell disease. Hyperhemolysis is another transfusion related complication of surface sickle cell disease with alloantibodies often presenting with severe anemia and reticulocytopenia 7 to 10 days after a blood transfusion. So remember, the hematocrit will be typically lower than the pre-transfusion value 
indicating the destruction of autologous RBCs. The direct Coombs test is often negative <clears throat> since RBCs have already been destroyed, and new allo antibodies may or may not be detectable. It is important to recognize this syndrome because the management consists of judicious avoidance of additional transfusions in the face of severe anemia. Acute chest syndrome and sickle cell disease. <clears throat> Case report. 19-year-old male with a history of sickle cell disease presented with fever, chest pain, and dyspnea. On physical exam, has high respiratory frequency and bilateral brows on auscultation. ABG, pH 7.46, PO2 low, the patient hypoxic, and CO2 normal. To low, due to tachypnea. The lab tests reveal anemia, leukocytosis, and high levels of ADH. Chest x ray with bilateral pulmonary infiltrates with low flower loads. Be very cautious with a sickle cell patient who begins with simple acute pain crisis but then develops chest pain, hypoxia, new pulmonary infiltrates, cough, and fever. This is as serious as it gets due to very high mortality, even if not, even if treated correctly. <clears throat> Fat embolism from bone marrow is responsible for 10% of cases. Typically follow severe bone pain due to marrow ischemia, 6 to 24 hours preceding it. Infections account for 30% of the cause. Treatment, oxygen, IV fluids, 1.5 times maintenance, antibiotics, and liberal pain control. Incentive spirometry, very important in often S on the board. And in severe cases, exchange transfusion to keep hemoglobin F less than 30%. <clears throat> Central nervous system disease. Children will have many, many strokes, while adults have large macro strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes are more common in adults from rupture of ischemic vessel wall than children. Acute management, exchange transfusion to keep hemoglobin F less than 30%, <clears throat> and chronic management, simple transfusions to keep hemoglobin F less than 30%. After 3 to 5 years, may relax with RBC transfusions to keep hemoglobin F less than 50%. Consider hydroxyurea as long-term treatment as well as aspirin. Modifying the disease. <clears throat> hydroxyurea increases fetal hemoglobin, reduces pain, and acute chest crisis and RBC transfusions. Very important trial to know. Primary prevention, the STOP trial. <clears throat> Measured the transcranial Doppler velocity in children, the TCD. If the TCD was more than 200 centimeters per second in large cerebral vessels, meaning there was occlusion, there was 40% stroke risk. So consider chronic blood transfusions keeping hemoglobin at less than 30% and hydroxyurea might reduce the TCD as well. Allogeneic stem cell transplantation is potentially curative. Consider in children with strokes, dactylitis, and frequent chest, acute chest, which is a very indicator of uh, things to come in the future. <clears throat> now, review of hemoglobin combinations you must know for the hematology boards, not necessarily the USMLEs or internal medicine boards. Sickle cell anemia, homozygous SS, hemoglobin A will be absent, hemoglobin S will be over 80%, hemoglobin F will be up to about 10% depending on the haplotype. Now, hemoglobin A present with hemoglobin S. If the A is more than S, then it's a sickle cell trait. If S is more than A, then it's double heterozygous S and beta plus thalassemia. If hemoglobin S is less than 35%, then it's double heterozygous hemoglobin S and alpha thal trait. <clears throat> now, if hemoglobin A1 is absent, if the hemoglobin S is more than 80%, it's sickle cell disease. If the hemoglobin C is more than 90%, it's hemoglobin C disease. And if hemoglobin S and C are in equal amounts, it's SC disease. And if it's hemoglobin A2 is more than 5%, consider double heterozygous hemoglobin S and beta 0 thalassemia. And if the hemoglobin F is more than 20%, consider double heterozygous hemoglobin S and HPFH, the persistent fetal hemoglobin. Now, in hemoglobin AS, the sickle cell trait, hemoglobin A typically dominates over hemoglobin S. And hemoglobin S slash beta positive thalassemia double heterozygote, hemoglobin S always dominates, typically 60-80%. But very important, you will have hemoglobin A. In hemoglobin S slash beta zero thalassemia, hemoglobin A will be absent, and that's how you differentiate the two. 
hemoglobin S slash alpha thalassemia double heterozygous. Hemoglobin S and alpha thalassemia, the percentage of hemoglobin A will greatly exceed the hemoglobin S beyond the typical 60 to 40 percent ratio seen in sickle cell traits. So consider this if the hemoglobin S is less than 35 percent. Now hemoglobin S slash C double heterozygous. About the hemoglobin S and C and, and S will be 50 percent each. Hemoglobin S slash hereditary persistent fetal hemoglobin. Obviously hemoglobin A will be absent. The S and the F will be about 50-50. Hemoglobin C disease. Negative and sickling test or solubility test will have 90% hemoglobin C. Other notable hemoglobins, hemoglobin E is very important to know since it's the most common hemoglobin variant in Southeast Asia. Literally millions of people have this. Usually it's asymptomatic, but hemoglobin E slash beta 0 thalassemia will be transfusion dependent. Hemoglobin C, <clears throat> again, lysine for glutamic acid in beta 6 position causes decreased solubility, increased RVC dehydration, so you'll see more target cells. <clears throat> and the key word to know is hemoglobin SC disease will have increased ocular and bone problems. The hemoglobin D, the point job in Los Angeles, again, is usually asymptomatic unless compound heterozygous hemoglobin D slash S, which will, be, will cause severe disease like hemoglobin SS. Now, hemoglobin oxygen affinity mutants. Number one, increased oxygen affinity hemoglobin, such as hemoglobin Chesapeake. Case report, 14-month-old asymptomatic boy is evaluated for polycythemia that was detected during a well child checkup. He has a family history of polycythemia. His oxygen saturation is normal. PO2 is normal. Hemoglobin 17, RBC counts elevated. WBC plate with normal. Peripheral smear unremarkable and erythropoietin level normal. That's the key. Remember, in P. vera, erythropoietin is low, and the true back type familial polycythemia, erythropoietin is elevated. So if you see polycythemia, erythropoietin normal, think high affinity hemoglobin. What test to perform? Answer calculate the hemoglobin P50. Remember, we discussed earlier normal P50 hemoglobin is 26, normal is a hurt mercury. So, <clears throat> think, of this, think of this in patient with familiar erythrocytosis and normal O2 saturation with normal erythropoietin levels. Hemoglobin in this case performs not to transform into the tenth deoxygenated hemoglobin state due to mutations which position negatively charged amino acids in the vicinity of negatively charged 2,3 BPG, hence retaining oxygen on the hemoglobin molecule. Since 2,3 BPG is repelled. The measurement of oxygen dissociation will reveal increased oxygen affinity. Therefore, hemoglobin oxygen saturation curve will be shifted to the left. Blood gas analyzers calculate the hemoglobin P50, the value at which 50% of hemoglobin is saturated with O2. Normally, at PO2 of 26, the percentage of hemoglobin O2 saturation is 50%. The P50 will be 26. Since the curve is shifted to the left, the PO2 at which O2 saturation is 50% will be less than 26. Decreased oxygen affinity hemoglobin, for instance, hemoglobin cancers. Newborn female discovers to have low oxygen saturation on room air, 85% in cyanosis. Her mother also has asymptomatic cyanosis, keyword so familial, and low oxygen saturation on room air, as well as anemia. Arterial PO2 normal. Remember, the PO2 is a testament of the lung gas exchange capability. It has nothing to do with hemoglobin. Think of this in a patient with familial asymptomatic anemia, cyanosis, decreased O2 saturation, and normal PO2. The patient will be cyanotic since the hemoglobin prefers to release oxygen and remain in the tense, the deoxygenated state, and hence refracts blue light appears as blue extremities and cyanosis clinically. The measurement of oxygen dissociation will reveal decreased oxygen and affinity, so curve will be shifted to the right. Measure hemoglobin P50. The P50 at which the hemoglobin O2 saturation is 50% will be more than 26. Congenital methemoglobinopathies. 30-day-old infant, seen in the office for a routine post. Follow up. 
He was born at full term from spontaneous vaginal delivery without any perinatal problems. But there is now mild central cyanosis on physical exam. Pulse oximeter revealed oxygen saturation to be 87% of room air. And on obtaining thermal arterial access, his blood has a dark chocolate appearance, keyword, despite documentation of arterial pulsation. Serum met hemoglobin level elevated, arterial PO2 normal. Remember, ferrous iron, which is a plus 2, undergoes oxidation easily to the plus 3, the ferric plus 3, and then cannot find oxygen, leading to cyanosis. Met hemoglobin is the Fe plus 3 hemoglobin which cannot bind to oxygen. Recall only that Fe plus 2 may find oxygen, caused by the deficiency of the enzyme NADH methemoglobin reductase, so it cannot reduce Fe plus 3 back to plus 2. Here the hemoglobin P50 will be 26, will be normal. Treatment, <coughs> oral ascorbic acid or methylene blue. Very important take homes. If there's increased hemoglobin oxygen affinity, the P50 will be less than 26, then patient will manifest erythrocytosis. If there's decreased hemoglobin oxygen affinity, the P50 of hemoglobin will be more than 26, the patient will be anemic and cyanotic. And if there's congenital methemoglobinopathy, the P50 of hemoglobin will be 26, and the patient will manifest symptomatic cyanosis. <coughs> Acquired methemoglobinemia. Case report. A four-year-old asymptomatic child administered benzocaine prior to endoscopy becomes cyanotic and tachypnic. O2 saturation decreased to 73% with normal arterial PO2. Blood is dark brown and does not turn red when exposed to oxygen. This is due to mutation in cytochrome B5 reductase gene, so again will not reduce methemoglobin and iron stays in the baric state plus 3 and cannot bind to oxygen. Treatment methylene blue as it serves as an electron carrier to NADPH. Avoid methylene blue in those with G6PD deficiency, will cause hemolysis, and hyperbaric O2 is last resort. <coughs> Carboxy hemoglobinemia. 45 year old industrial warehouse worker presenting to the emergency room during the winter, when the windows are closed, with headache and malaise. She works in an unventilated indoor environment, skin with cherry red spots, keyword, hemoglobin slightly elevated, indicates chronic exposure. Arterial PO2 normal, reflects O2 dissolved in blood and proper O2 gas exchange from the lungs. On ABG, carboxy hemoglobin elevated more than 15%. Pulse oximeter with decreased O2 saturation. Carbon monoxide poisoning is responsible for up to 40,000 emergency departments yearly. May be caused by chronic or acute exposure to industrial fumes, heavy cigarette smoking, or motor vehicles operating in poorly ventilated areas, such as garages. Carbon monoxide is odorless and it binds to hemoglobin at the same site as oxygen but with higher affinity. The hypoxia in the acute setting may cause seizures and death. In the chronic setting, it may cause erythrocytosis. Treatment 100% oxygen and removal of the surface of the carbon monoxide. Consider hyperbaric oxygen if carbon monoxide is more than 25%. Hemoglobin H disease missing three alpha genes. 10 year old Iranian female presenting with anemia and mental retardation. Multiple family members are anemic as well. Palpable hepatosplenomegaly through secondary erythropoiesis on exam. Hemoglobin 9, microcytic with elevated serotonin. Hemoglobin electrophoresis reveals 30% hemoglobin H. Patients with hemoglobin H disease have three alpha gene deletions. Since there's more beta chains being produced, we'll develop hemoglobin H. That's four beta chain tetramers which may be unstable and precipitate at times of stress and may cause hemolytic anemia. <clears throat> Think of hemoglobin H disease if child presents with alpha thalassemia and mental retardation. Caused by the deletion of dosage-sensitive genes on one 16p telomere. Important concept to know is that elevated ferritin is not related to blood transfusions, but increased iron absorption due to ineffective erythropoiesis. It may also occur in the setting of myelodysplastic syndrome in which somatic mutations in the ATRX gene downregulate alpha globin production. Some other unstable hemoglobins to know are hemoglobin cold, hemoglobin zeric, tacoma, and viva. 
and you can memorize the uh, substitutions from the book. <coughs> These hemoglobins precipitate and are destroyed in the reticulum methylate system, and we'll see Heinz bodies on crystal violet staining, which is denatured hemoglobin. Treatment for these would be to avoid oxidant agents, administer folate, and splenectomy for severe hemolysis. Now, abnormalities of the RBC membrane. One, hereditary spherocytosis. Case report. 23-year-old male with a history of gallstones, presenting with fatigue, hemoglobin 8, normal WBC, plate with PT, PTT, and splenomegaly on exam. Patient with a family history of anemia requiring splenectomy. Elevated reticulocyte count, low haptoglobin, Elevated LDH, negative Drake Coombs test, so it's not autoimmune. Elevated NCHC due to cellular dehydration. Spherocytes appreciated on the peripheral smear. Positive osmotic fragility test, and now we need to know positive eosin 5 malamide binding test, BMA. Hemoglobin S is due to a genetic mutation. Spectrin is a major protein on the RBC skeleton, comprising approximately 75% of its mass. There are two types of interactions in the RBC cytoskeleton. One, vertical interactions, which is the spectrum and quin, and three, association with lipid bilayer. Two, horizontal interactions, which is the assembly of alpha and beta spectrum into the heterodimers to form the tetramers. Hereditary spherocytosis involves apparent interactions between the skeleton, spectrum and anchorin, and the overlying lipid bilayer with a vertical interaction causing destabilization of the lipid bilayer and reduced deformability of the RBC. The RBCs are destroyed in the spleen, so the child may develop a hyperhemolytic crisis and accelerate a hemolysis leading to jaundice. They also develop aplastic crisis with parvo infections or severe folate deficiency. <coughs> the osmotic fragility test using increasingly hypotonic saline solutions will support the diagnosis. Newer test to know is the EOSIN 5 cytoskeleton binding test. The EMA binds to band 3 on RBCs and is measured by fluorescent intensity. Reduction in intensity corresponds to the reduction of band 3 of the RBC seen in hereditary spherocytosis. Treatment follows supplementation to splenectomy. After age 5, if hemolysis is still persisting, then check for excessively spleen if hemolysis persists after splenectomy. Hereditary elliptocytosis and hereditary pyrofoglocytosis. Similar to hereditary spherocytosis, except that it is protein 4.1 and glycophorin C, a horizontal interaction problem. There are four distinct subtypes. First, <coughs> common hereditary elliptocytosis. You see biconcave elliptocytes, broad shaped elliptocytes. Next, spherocytic hereditary elliptocytosis in between the spheros hereditary spherocytosis and hereditary elliptocytosis. Next, Southeast Asian ovalocytosis. Spoon-shaped elliptocytes will be seen. And lastly, hereditary pyrofoglocytosis. It's a severe form of hereditary elliptocytosis. Just like hereditary spherocytosis, the cytoskeleton of the RBC becomes weakened. Most will not other conditions such as myodysplasia, myofibrosis, thalassemia, B12 or iron deficiency. Usually in these cases, the percentage of lymphocytes will be less than 60%. Remember, HPP is a severe form of HE and may present a very low MCP and hemolytic anemia. However, most are asymptomatic. Treatment, folate supplementation, and splenectomy for symptomatic hemolytic anemia. <coughs> Other notable RBC membrane disorders. One, acanthocytosis. Erythrocytes with multiple irregular projections caused by the transfer of cholesterol from plasma lipoproteins onto the RBC membrane. In Z syndrome, acanthocytes seen in NCH alcoholic cirrhosis plus hemolytic anemia. And A beta lipoproteinemia is a congenital absence of beta A beta lipoprotein B in plasma. It's important. Think of a child with retinitis pigmentosa, mental retardation, ataxia, and acanthocytes. Somatocytes, wide transverse slit or stoma toward the center of the RBC. Inherited form due to abnormality in cation permeability may cause increased thrombosis after splenectomy and acquired may be seen in alcoholics. RH deficiency, null syndrome. Increased rates of cation transport in sodium potassium membrane ATPS activity that results in dehydrated RBCs may lead to hemolytic anemia. 
<coughs> abnormality of the RBC enzymes. Normal metabolism of the mature RBC involves two principal pathways of glucose metabolism. One, the glycolytic pathway to produce ATP and 2,3-BPG. Two, hexose modified six chunks to reduce NADPH and glutathione to keep iron in the plus two state. Pyruvate kinase deficiency case report. Newborn infant from Northern Europe ancestry presents with hemolytic anemia and phonomegaly. Peripheral smear reveals small, dense, quinated cells, the echinocytes, keyword, negative Crohn's test, normal osmotic fragility test. What to screen for? Answer, pyruvate kinase deficiency. The most common congenital non spherocytic hemolytic anemia can be caused by defect in the glycolytic RBC metabolism, therefore the need decreased RBC production. Treatment, fullid and splenectomy. Be careful as these patients may also develop post-op thrombosis and allos stem cell transplant may be cured of. <coughs> Glucose, phosphatase, isomerase, and hexokinase deficiency also result in reduced ATP <coughs> and 2,3-BPG production, which may result in hemolytic anemia in a child. In Wilson's disease, may develop an acquired hexokinase deficiency due to elevated copper levels, which leads to hemolysis. Phosphor fructokinase deficiency, TFK deficiency. Think of PFK deficiency in a child with mental retardation, muscle spasticity, seizures, and hemolytic anemia. Muscle biopsy will relieve a modest increase in self sacralimol glycogen. Glycogen is a stored form of glucose and serves as a buffer for glucose needs. There are a number of inborn areas of glycogen metabolism that result from mutations in genes related to glycogen metabolism. <coughs> Those disorders that result in abnormal storage of glycogen are known as glycogen storage diseases. Abnormalities of hexose modified state chunks. 1. Glucose 6-phosphatase dehydrogenase deficiency. Case report. 38-year-old African-American male, status was renal transplantation, cyclosporine, prednisone, keyboard, spectrum, presenting with dyspnea and dark urine, which is hemoglobinuria. Elevated retic counts, elevated LDH, low haptoglobin, Elevated indirect bilirubin and negative Coombs test, so it's not autoimmune. Normal WBC, platelets, PT, PTT, and creatinine, so not DIC or TTP. Bite cells and Heinz bodies appreciated on peripheral smear. Decreased G6PD activity diminishes nicotine adenine dinucleotide phosphate production, NADPH production, and prevents reduction of met hemoglobin to hemoglobin by reduced glutathione leading to oxidation of hemoglobin by oxidant radicals, which causes Heinz bodies, the nature of hemoglobin and RBC formation and hemolysis. It's X-linked, so if you see it in a female, it's due to lionization of the X chromosome. The gene lends to increased survival and advantage in patients with falciform malaria. Many genetic variants of this disease in which the enzyme will exhibit normal activity to diminish activity leading to hemolysis. The variant enzymes are identified depending on where they position on the electrophoretic gel. So the G6PDB is a wild type enzyme. The G6PDA plus is a normal enzyme activity. The G6PDA minus is the unstable enzyme which will cause anemia if it's exposed to oxygen drugs. G6PDA minus variants, even if provoked by an oxygen drug, sometimes with adequate reticulocytosis, will compensate for hemolysis as the newly formed reticulocytes will have higher levels of G6PD and may be resistant to destruction. Now, hemolysis due to extrinsic abnormalities of the RBC. 1. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia. In autoimmune hemolytic anemia, RBC destruction is mediated by autoimmune antibodies. It may be either cold or warm, classified by the temperature at which autoantibodies attach to and destroy the RBCs. Drugs may also cause hemolytic anemia by four mechanisms, which we'll discuss. Direct Coombs test is usually positive in autoimmune hemolytic anemia, but it may also be negative. In the direct Coombs test, since IgM is usually clear from RBCs during washing, it will not be detected. Instant complement will be positive. If the Coombs test is negative, then sometimes you can diagnose by using the more sensitive RBC bound ELISA. Also, 1 in 10,000 healthy donors have a positive DAT, 
most never develop autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, IgG, case report. 55-year-old female with rheumatoid arthritis presenting with jaundice and anemia. Splenomegaly, elevated reticulocyte count, and LDH, low haptoglobin, normal PT, PTT, WBC, and platelet count, and creatinine, so not DIC or TTP. Spherocytes, on smear, and positive direct cones test IgG. Warm IgG antibodies bind to antigen at temperatures of 37 degrees Celsius. Warm IgG antibodies do not fix complement the destruction is mediated through FC receptor destruction by macrophages in the spleen. Extravascular hemolysis. Test the performance direct comes test for IgG and complement. Warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, maybe idiopathic, or secondary to infection, autoimmune disease, malignancy, or drugs such as methyl dopa. Treatment for the warm hemolytic anemia. Matching a serocompatible donor for RBC transfusion may be a problem, but if the patient needs a transfusion, then transfuse the least compatible blood that may be matched. Steroids will decrease the autoantibody production and decrease macrophage endocytosis of the RBCs. Initial steroid dose should be 1 mg per kg of prednisone, and once remission is achieved, then taper the steroid dose to 10 mg per kg until you reach 20 mg per day. Then taper very slowly, 5 mg per week, until the DAT becomes negative, but realistically cannot always achieve a negative DAT. If prednisone is ineffective, then consider full high dose steroids. If hemolysis cannot be stopped after several weeks, consider splenectomy. And use rituximab, immunosuppressants, and chemotherapy in refractory cases. Cold <coughs> autoimmune hemolytic anemia, IgM, 34 year old female with mycoplasma pneumonia, keyword, presenting with anemia, jaundice, elevator retake count, LDH, low haptoglobin, normal PT, PTT, WBC, platelet count, and creatinine. Spherocytes on smear and positive direct Coombs test to complement and not to IgG. Peripheral smear revealing agglutinated RBCs. If the DAT is complement positive only, then it is IgM cold agglutin mediated. Review smear for agglutination which you'll see large pentameric IgM causing the glutation of the RBCs. Important. Warm IgG binds to RBCs at 37 degrees Celsius, does not fix complements or extravascular hemolysis and spleen. Cold IgM binds to RBC at less than 37 degrees Celsius, fixes complements, so intravascular hemolysis. Seen in mycoplasma pneumonia, Epstein Barr virus infection, CLL, and the elderly. Cold IgG minus RBC at less than 37 degrees Celsius is the donut lansdiner antibody which fixes complements and is seen in TNH against the T-antigen on the RBC. Also, during childhood, the autoimmune hemolytic anemia is due, the, is due to the donut lansdiner IgG. Patients with autoimmune hemolytic anemia may also have alloantibodies versus pregnant females with previous transfusions. The most definitive technique for detecting alloantibodies in the presence of autoantibodies is called autoabsorption. An aliquot of the patient's serum is repeatedly absorbed with the patient's own erythrocytes and then tested for alloreactivity with a panel or donor erythrocytes in a standard antibody screen. Treatment of cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, avoid cold environments, plasmapheresis in severe cases, rituximab may be helpful, steroids and splenectomy are usually ineffective. Drugs may also cause immune-mediated hemolytic anemia by four mechanisms. One, autoantibody directed against RBC antigens, for instance, methyl dopa, fodarabine, onsaliplatin, and lenalidomide. Formation of autoantibodies reactive with RBCs in the absence of instigating drugs. Two, hapten drug absorption, a mechanism in which the antibodies only bind to RBC membrane which has drug bound to it. For instance, penicillin, cephalosporins, and cephalosporins, the antibodies only bind to RBC that is coated with the drug. 3. Immune complex mechanism. Antibodies recognize a new antigen formed between the drug and the epitope of the RBC membrane. Heparin, for instance, pemetrexid, metformin. Antibody recognizes a new antigen created by a combination of the drug and the RBC antigen. And lastly, a non-immunologic protein absorption. Drug 
alters their RBC membrane, rendering it more susceptible to destruction, such as cephalopin. Coombs tests will be positive also in drug mediated hemolytic anemia, and the hapta mediated will be IgG, tertiary immune complex complement, autoantibody formation IgG. Only the non immunologic protein absorption will be negative. Hemoly drug induced hemolytic anemia. The hemolytic anemia typically occurs 7 to 10 days after initiation of the drug and it may take up to 2 weeks for it to clear after the cessation of the offending agent. Remember that fludarabine may cause autoantibody formation in patients with being tested with CLL, being treated with CLL rather. Treatment, withdrawal pending drug and steroids are ineffective. Hemolytic anemia due to infection. Gram positive organisms such as staph, strep, enterococcus, can cause anemia. Anaerobic organisms such as clostridium, so watch out for septic abortions or gangrenous cholecystitis. The alpha toxin may cause intravascular hemolysis. Salmonella, typhoid fever, will cause agglutination of RBCs. Mycoplasma pneumonia will cause cold agglutin and IgM. Viruses such as CMV, EVV, HSV. Remember, the EVV will cause cold agglutin and activating complement needed RBC destruction. Also, bartonellosis, organism binds to the surface of the RBC, which then is cleared by the spleen. Babesiosis causes intravascular hemolytic anemia, so look for intra-erythrocytic parasites on the thin blood smear. And malaria, which is the most common cause of hemolytic anemia worldwide, the infected erythrocytes are destroyed in the spleen, so look for parasites on a thick, right thin blood smear. That's why we always have to check the thin and the thick, checking for these two organisms. Proxesmal and nocturnal hemoglobin or PNH, case report. 29 year old male admitted to the hospital with severe headaches and discovered to have superior sagittal vein thrombosis. He has no known hypercritical risk factors. The CBC reveals hemoglobin 8 with low MCV, slightly low WBC and platelet counts, LDH elevated, low haptoglobin, negative Coombs test, elevated indirect bilirubin, normal PT, PTT, and creatinine. Positive urine hemosiderin, very important. Low iron and low ferritin, iron deficiency from ongoing intravascular hemolysis. Flow confirms a diagnosis of PNH by immunophenotyping of granulocytes and red cells, which are negative for CD59 and CD55 in 52% of the cells. Think of PNH when patient has hemolytic anemia and thrombosis. CD59 is a complement regulatory protein called membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis. CD59 is decay acceleration factor. These proteins are usually held on the cell surface by glycosyl inositol anchor, the GPI anchor. Mutation in the pig A gene resulting in defective synthesis of GPI anchor, the CD55 and CD59 proteins are not held on the RDC membrane. TNH results from the loss of CD59, which usually inactivate complement on the RBC cell surface. And since complement complex is not inactivated on the RBC membrane, it leads to complement mediated destruction of the RBCs. The lysis of the RBCs releases prothrombotic factors in the circulation, which leads to hypercriable state. Oftentimes, patients who present with aplastic anemia later on develop TNH, the theory being that hematopoietic precursors which lack the GPI actually will evade the immune destruction, which is causing the hepatic anemia, and will have a survival advantage and flourish. Diagnosis is by flow cytometry, which identifies absence of GPI anchor protein CD55 and 59 on the surface of the RBCs and granulocytes. Patient has hemolysis in the setting of hepatic anemia, MDS, or MPD, think PMH. The patient has hemolysis in the setting, like we said, they also may develop thrombosis in unusual sites such as hepatic vein, but carry syndrome, cerebral or intra-abdominal veins, to name a few. There's also increased risk of thrombosis during pregnancy, so consider DVT prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. The disease may vary in severity depending on the percentage of PNH clone. If you have less than 10% PNH clone, the patient will be asymptomatic. If more than 50% PNH clone can cause serious problems for the patient. Treatment. Replace folates as there's ongoing hemolysis. Two, iron supplementation. To replace urinary losses from intravascular hemolysis. Next, steroids may reduce complement activation and hence hemolysis. Next, transfusions if needed. Next, echolizumab. 
humanized monoclonal antibody against C5 complement protein, which prevents terminal complement formation and decreased hemolysis that leads to decreased in thrombosis. But also be careful as Neisseria meningitides requires complement activation, so must vaccine against it. If you have significant pancytopenia, consider ATG or cyclosporine treatment. Consider DT prophylaxis in pregnant females or patients with large clonal populations of PNH more than 50%. Palos and flow transplant may be curative. Hemolytic anemia due to physical and chemical agents. Copper, accumulation or RBC can interfere with the NADPH pathway, Wilson's disease. Lead will cause abnormal hemoglobin synthesis. We'll see basophilic stippling. Spider bites, the brown recluse spider toxin will cause hemolysis. Dapsone, using PCP prophylaxis will cause methemoglobinemia. Rivivarin, to treat hepatitis C may cause hemolysis. Benazipuridine, used for bladder analgesia, used more than two days may result in methemoglobinemia. These things may cause DIC and hemolysis. Third degree burns will cause hemolysis. Hemolytic anemia due to fragmentation and destruction of RBCs. 54 year old female with a mechanical aortic valve presenting with anemia, low haptoglobin, elevated LDH, reticulocytosis, elevated indirect bilirubin, normal PT, PTT creatinine, serum B12, folate TSH, all normal, negative pump test. Exam of peripheral smear reveals multiple schistocytes. Fragmentation hemolysis occurs within the vasculature. It is mechanical damage to the RBC membrane resulting in fragmentation of the RBCs which appear as schistocytes on the peripheral smear. In DIC, endothelial damage to the microvasculature causes a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which along with activation of coagulation system, causes elevation of PT-PTT. In thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura slash HUS, a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is due to platelet activation, not clotting factors. Fibrous strands fill the microvasculature resulting in fragmentation of RBCs as they traverse through them. The aortic aneurysm, aortic bloom pumps may also cause hemolysis. Intravascular hemolysis may occur after cabbage as well. RBCs may also be fragmented as they go through a dysfunctional mechanical or calcified heart valve. The turbulent flow results in high shear stress, which causes fragmentation of RBCs. Bioprosthetic valves have a lower rate of hemolysis than mechanical valves. Remember that if hemolysis is chronic, then iron will eventually be lost via the urine, and this will eventually use iron deficiency anemia. Also, consider health syndrome. Microangiopathic hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets in pregnant patients with schistocytes, thrombocytopenia, normal LTH with elevated L LFTs. Certain drugs may also cause CTPHUS, such as cyclosporin, sacrolimus, mitomycin, clopidogrel, and diclodopine. Hypertensive emergencies will damage capillaries, which result in platelet activ activation, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, renal damage, and thrombocytopenia. Foot strike hemolysis, case report. Soldier presenting with dark urine, hemoglobin urea, after a long march. Normal CPK levels, so no rhabdomyolysis, anemia with low haptoglobin, elevated retic count, and negative Coombs test, with normal PT, PTT, and creatinine. This is caused by trauma due to direct injuries to RBCs in the blood vessels of the extremities. Treatment to stop the activity causing it. Gasabach Merritt Syndrome. Young child with a large hemangioendothelioma presenting with anemia, low haptoglobin, elevated reticulocyte like counts and negative Coombs test with elevated PT PTT. Consumptive coagulopathy occurring in the capillaries of the hemangioendothelioma. Treatment surgical removal, steroids, or embolization. Thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome, TTP class HUS. Case report, a 40-year-old female presenting with fever, pain in the abdomen, vomiting, and delirium. Hemoglobin 8 with retic count 9% elevated, platelet count 56,000, PT, PTT normal, so not in DIC, LDH very elevated, keyword. Creatinine elevated, haptoglobin low, elevated indirect bilirubin, and negative Coombs test, so not, not autoimmune. Numerous schistocytes on peripheral smear, four per high power field. Remember, you need at least one per high power field. Thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura is a multisystemic disorder characterized by fever, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, or MAHA, 
thrombocytopenia, neurologic symptoms, and impaired renal function. Platelet counts are usually diminished, whereas the bone marrow reveals a large number of megakaryocytes, indicating peripheral destruction and consumption of platelets. Coagulation studies in patients with TCPHUS are typically normal, which helps differentiate this entity from the IC. The peripheral smell may show abundance of schistocytes, reticulocytes, and at times, nucleated red blood cells, which is an act of compensating marrow. Serum LDH and indirect bilirubin are all elevated as a result of mechanical destruction of red blood cells. TTP, characterized by neurologic signs, and HUS, characterized by renal failure, are considered to be distinct syndromes and often overlap. Very serious, as is high mortality even if treated correctly. HUS is usually caused by E. coli 015787 7 producing sugar toxin bacteria, which is toxic to the endothelial cells, and TTP is usually caused by congenital either deficiency or acquired autoantibody formation to ADMGS13. And large von Willebrand multimers are not broken down and hence bind to inactivate platelets, forming microthrombi through the microvasculature. Other causes are drugs, such as cyclosporin, mitomycin, clopidogrel, can be seen in allo transplant patients who receive TBI associated with pregnancy or autoimmune disease, or it could be idiopathic and may be even become chronic and intermittent relapsing. There's a new path pathogenesis of an HUS like syndrome related to antivascular endothelial growth factor therapy, VEGF therapy, causing damage to the renal plebiscites, causing HUS type disease, not ADMTS 13 driven. In TTP, Adam TS13 levels, however, do not correlate with severity of disease and are not helpful in the diagnosis. Just going back to the, the VEGF therapy, there was a trial done in which sunitinib was added to bevacizumab and the setting of renal flux carcinoma, and there was a high rate of HUS TTT appreciated. So these anti VEGF treatments are toxic to the renal photocytes and drive the HUS-like symptoms. Treatment, plasma exchange, either with whole fresh frozen plasma or cryo supernatant bone marrow manufacture deficiency. Plasma, exchange of a single plasma volume daily is standard but it may increase to twice daily if patient not responding. Steroids, rituximab, immunosuppressants, Withdrawal of the offending drug. Antibiotics, IV fluids, and other supportive care measures if needed. Dialysis if needed. If chronic relapsing, follow LDH and hemoglobin. If hemolysis reinitiates, then begin plasma exchange as outpatient if possible, and therapy several times a week. In anti VEGF induced HUS, withdraw the anti VEGF treatment and supportive care. Very important, do not transfuse platelets as it may cause massive diffuse thrombosis as the platelets will bind to the large and cleave on low run multimers. Continue treatment until LDH and platelet counts are normalized. This concludes the hemolytic anemia chapter. Thank you.